such a talk without PowerPoint. Um, but I think um, I'll, I'll try and I guess maybe make the next hour a bit more uh, interactive and get some involvement. Um, I won't go down the route of kind of any interpretive LHC team dance um, because they will probably make it even harder. But I hope that you will um, enjoy it and maybe learn a little bit more about what um, we're doing over at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. There's been a bit of an introduction to me already, but just to say a little bit more. So I studied natural sciences during Hubert about 15 years ago now, um, and then did my PhD in the high energy physics group before actually going off to the Netherlands, uh, where I was a lecturer in physics in Maastricht for a few years uh, before I returned. Um, and I've actually been on the Atlas collaboration at CERN now for over 10 years, and most of my research has been trying to use the collisions there to work out what dark matter would, uh, might be made of, and I'll be talking about this more in the talk. Um, so I'll give an outline about what I'm going to talk about for the next, um, well, what's now probably about 40 minutes. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we as humans are made of, but also what the universe is made of. And I guess an interesting observation we'll see early on is that actually what makes up the universe is a very small fraction, uh, sorry, what makes up us is a very small fraction of what actually makes up the universe and most mass and energy. Um, I will have to uh, delve very briefly into our current model for what we think uh, make up the fundamental particles and interactions in the universe, uh, which is very, I'd say, unimaginatively called the standard model. Um, there's also a standard model of cosmology as well, for those of you who've read in that area. I'll then talk uh, a bit about the history of CERN over in Switzerland. So this is the European um, Laboratory for Particle Physics. Um, and then I'll talk about the Large Hadron Collider. And hopefully, um, if we can get through all of that, uh, we'll go on to um, how we might search uh, for dark matter at the LHC, and also if you found it already so far. Um, and unsurprisingly, based on the fact you've never seen me excitedly waving the Nobel Prize around, we haven't yet had any discoveries, but we have been able to use the data sets um, to uh, constrain possible uh, candidates for dark matter. Um, so unfortunately, I'm doing this entirely without all the jazzy pictures and analogies, um, but I would like to encourage if any of you want to learn more about this after, please reach out um, either by email um, or through social media. Um, I'll try and share these slides so that they can be sent around the size of mailing list for if any of you do want to appreciate the visuals more uh, later on. Okay, so what are we made of? Um, and um, maybe because um, it's now just me without screen, let's have some some thoughts shouted out from the audience. So, so what do you think we're made of? Atoms. Pardon? Atoms. Atoms, yep. Yeah. So atom is actually the Greek word for indivisible. So um, people originally thought that um, atoms were the basic building blocks of the universe. And it was um, over 100 years ago and now that Rutherford did his famous gold oil experiment um, that actually showed that uh, atoms themselves are mostly empty states and actually are made of a small positively charged nucleus with electrons um, going around them. Um, okay, so anyone willing to go smaller than atoms? Up and down. Up and down? Up and down what? Quarks. Yes, exactly. So actually, um, of the particles that make up the atom, so we've got a small positively charged nucleus, which is actually made of protons and neutrons, um, and then electrons are going around in orbitals, and those of you who are actually based here in the chemistry department will be able to tell me much more about that than, than I possibly can. Um, so when I say what we're made of, actually as a particle physicist, what we're really searching for is, I guess, the smallest building blocks. So when I say it's small or fundamental, what I mean is we don't think they can be broken down any further. So um, as has just been, I guess, highlighted, um, so the electron around the um, atom we do think are fundamental particles. So you can smash an electron as hard as you possibly can into any target, and we don't think it would really break up into smaller things. However, the protons and the neutrons that make up the nucleus uh, do have a substructure. And actually, we think that protons and neutrons are made of a, a smaller type of particle called quark. And in particular, there are two um, types of quark, the up and the down, uh, that combine in different combinations to make protons and neutrons. So protons is up, up, down, and neutron is down, down, up. And actually, the up and down quark form the lightest family of actually what three families of quark um, that increase in mass, and I'll, I'll talk more about those later. Um, so actually, one of the reasons we're really interested in understanding these fundamental particles is that we think that, you know, of the order of 13 to 14 billion years ago, our universe came into existence in a big singularity called the Big Bang. 
And actually, um, you know, all of these fundamental particles in our, in our model would have been produced in this event. So understanding how they behave and interact with each other is actually really important for being able to understand how we went from the conditions in the early universe to what we see around us today. Um, so, good. so yeah, we, we have, um, in our standard model, we have an understanding of what we think these basic building blocks are. Um, and um, although this model has been very, very successful, we also know it's not complete, and we'll be going back to that later. Um, so actually, I mean, just to, to dwell a little bit more about what, what we as humans are made of, um, so actually 99% of the average human is made up of hydrogen, carbon, um, nitrogen, and oxygen. Um, and around 60% of that adults is water. Um, I don't know, you're all, well, a lot of you are in week five terms, so maybe a certain proportion of that is also caffeine or whatever <laughs> you've been sustaining yourselves on for the last five weeks. Um, but um, as I said before, although we're all made up of these atoms, actually, um, you know, 99.999999% of us um, and the atoms we're made of is actually empty space. Um, and it's pretty cool that if you took all of, if you took out all the empty space inside a human, um, then you could actually put the entire human race inside a sugar cube. Um, so maybe that's something to put us on a little bit of perspective for the next few weeks. So looking at those elements that we're all made of, actually hydrogen is the only one of these elements that I guess directly resulted from the particles um, in the Big Bang. So um, we had our elementary particles in the early universe. Um, and as it expanded and cooled, um, there was a something called the period of recombination, which is actually when the first time, so I think it's called recombination, so it's actually the first time that electrons and protons combine to make hydrogen atoms. But actually a lot of the heavier elements um, are formed by nuclear processing stars, like, um, well, so our star is, uh, our sun is a second generation star, um, but um, fusion reactions inside the star allow us to create the, the heavy elements. Okay. So I'm now going to say a little bit more about the history of uh, the universe. And part of that is because often when you hear um, people talking about what we're doing at the LHC, we say we're trying to recreate the conditions of the Big Bang. So we think that um, our universe originated 13.8 billion years ago. Um, and actually, uh, at um, that moment in um, at that instant, in fact, basically all of the mass and the energy of the universe was in a single singularity um, I guess equivalent to what we think goes on inside a black hole. Um, and then um, there was a kind of big, I can't even try to imagine what we can think of it like. If anyone has ever watched Interstellar the movie, a singularity is not how they portray going into a black hole, let me remember that. But um, anyway, so there's a big explosion, all um, massive energy that we, um, I guess, know about today came into existence. It was followed by a period of very rapid inflation. And one of the reasons this was really interesting is actually, you know, the, um, the volume of the universe expanded um, many, many times in a short period of time, such that many parts of the universe actually became causally disconnected from each other. Um, and when I say causally disconnected, what, what I mean is we're, we're limited um, by Einstein's relativity um, in um, the, the separation you can get between regions of space and time where things can send messages between us. So there are bits of the early universe that we were, I guess, causally connected to then and, and now um, can never possibly <coughs> make observations of again. And so at the end of um, the period of inflation, the, the visible universe was around the size of a grapefruit, um, which I had a great picture of, but it's not there, just imagine it. Um, and um, following this period of inflation, the universe continued to expand and cool. Um, and actually eventually we got atoms um, and then also the, the matter in the universe um, started to come together to give the, the galaxies and structures that we see today. Um, and probably one of the, the best readouts we have to study um, some of these conditions in the early universe is something called the cosmic microwave background. So these are, um, I guess, uh, photons left over from that period of recombination that have since been redshifted um, as the universe expands and actually uh, making measurements of uh, the cosmic microwave background has told us a lot about cosmology and uh, what we think the universe is made of today. Okay, so what is the universe made of? In fact, actually, great time for some, um, I guess, interaction again. What do you all think the universe is made of? Space. 
space. <laughs> yeah, let's not get too philosophical. So yeah, I mean, we exist in um, the existence space. We actually exist on a, um, I guess, a, a manifold of space-time. So we actually, Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us that um, actually gravity is a result of um, mass and energy in the universe warping the fabric of space-time. Um, and that causes the paths of objects, including photons, uh, to change. But I'm not going to say any more about that today because uh, it's way beyond the scope of God, much at UHT. Um, okay, so what do we think? Um, what do we think the universe is made of? Void. Pardon? Void. Pardon? Void. Void. Empty. Void. Oh, that's 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 a little bit of a, a, a dismal outlook. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, to give you the numbers, so about five percent of the mass of the mass and energy in our universe we understand to be made of the what we call the baryonic matter, so the same types of matter that make up you and I. Um, so actually, um, then twenty five percent of that is something called dark matter. So um, we use the term dark because we don't think dark matter interacts electromagnetically, so we can't see it through light. However, we have seen its gravitational um, effects in the universe. Um, and actually, this is one of the biggest outstanding questions uh, that we need to answer in the next uh, decades, is actually what dark matter is made of and how it fits into our current stellar model. Um, there's also a substance that's even more funky, which makes up about 70% uh, of the mass and energy in the universe, and that's something called dark energy. Um, and actually, in terms of how dark energy affects the behavior of the universe, we think it's the, the effects of dark energy is actually causing um, the rate of expansion of our universe to accelerate. So it's kind of got an anti-gravity effect. And unfortunately, whilst I'm pretty confident that the LHC might be able to say something exciting about dark matter, I'm not convinced the LHC will find the answer to what dark energy is. Um, so if, uh, yeah, this is maybe a challenge for all of you in the, in the coming years to, to take up. Um, but the fact that we can only describe 5% of the mass and energy um, in the universe in the current standard model is, is pretty disappointing. Um, and actually, um, it was measurements, including, for example, that of the cosmic microwave uh, background that actually allowed us to get some um, accurate readouts of what we, um, what we think the universe is currently made of. Interestingly enough, the relative amounts of, for example, dark matter, dark uh, energy, and baryonic matter and um, light, in fact, have, um, have changed over, over cosmological time. And again, um, this is something that when you go to the standard model of cosmology, um, which is different from the standard model of particle physics, you can explain um, how, that, um, how that works. Okay, so what do you all think CERN has to do with the Big Bang? Hands up if anyone thinks that we're trying to or hoping to create a large uh, black hole that's going to swallow up the universe. <laughs> Okay, laughter, that hopefully means no. Um, I'll give one anecdote, which was, I guess, long enough ago now that I was an undergraduate, uh, before I went to CERN, I was going to work over the summer, um, uh, I was working as a waitress, and that morning the LHC was uh, going to be switching on, and it was all very exciting. And my local radio station, Heart FM, was doing a very dramatic countdown to the end of the universe. Um, on my way into work. And my shift started at nine, the LHC was, I think, due to switch on at nine. And, you know, I, I listened to the build up, it was all great. And then, you know, 15 minutes later, looked at my watch and, you know, sighed a, a, a breath of relief that the world hadn't ended. Um, actually, that particular countdown to the end of the universe, um, they weren't actually going to be making any collisions in the LHC. Um, they were just sending one beam one way round. Um, so it was anticlimactic on every level. <laughs> Uh, however, um, the um, high energy proton proton collisions that we can generate at the Large Hadron Collider do allow us to recreate the conditions um, that existed actually within a billionth of a second of the Big Bang. Um, so, if we again um, think of Einstein's equation, E is equal to mc squared, this gives us an equivalence between mass and energy. Um, and you know, we use this in nuclear power by taking small mass differences between uh, nuclei and converting that to energy. But we can also do it the other way around in colliders and take high energy collisions and use that to create new massive particles. Um, and the good thing is by creating um, particles in the standard model, we can then study their properties um, and test our theory. Um, but also um, we're looking for cracks in it. So by trying to you know, spend decades 
creating a great model, and then actually your best priority is to then try and take it apart or find holes in it, because that could provide answers to some of the outstanding questions. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, so um, before going any further, uh, I mean, you all laughed when I said we were going to produce a black hole, but actually, um, we would never have produced a black hole at the LHC, which would have swallowed up the universe. And the reason for that is the, the kind of black holes that you see in, um, in astrophysics that are you know, many, many million, uh, times the mass of the sun um, are immensely massive. Um, and actually, the sort of black holes we would produce in uh, the LHC were we to produce them, actually, uh, I guess, they fulfill the requirement to produce an event horizon around the singularity. But really what we're talking about is there being a lot of energy in a very small region of space and their effective mass would actually still be relatively small um, on, on the, the sort of scales we're looking at. Um, and actually, if we did produce a black hole at the LHC, it would decay almost immediately. So we'd only know about it through this very energetic collision event. And actually the reason that um, we were really, really excited to try and look for black holes at the LHC is that um, of the various outstanding problems in our universe at the moment, there are big questions about why gravity is actually relatively weak compared to the other forces we know about, and we'll be talking about this later. And some of the models that try to explain the relative weakness of gravity actually think that, well, maybe there are extra spatial dimensions that we don't know about. And it turns out that if you have those additional spatial dimensions on top of the, the three spatial dimensions we live in, um, they might be very small or curled up, then uh, the likelihood of creating black holes at the LHC would go up. Um, so actually one of my first publications um, in the second LHC data taking run was we did a new search for black holes and again we didn't find any, which was a shame. Okay, um, so again, because I guess we're, we're at, well, we have the opportunity to be more flexible on account of there um, not being any slides I have to be accountable for sticking to. I wonder if any of you had any questions at this point. I mean, I hope that that's because everything has been clear rather than I've lost everyone in the first 10 minutes, um, so I'll keep going. Um, and I'm now going to try and just tell you a little bit more about our model for what we think everything is made of. Um, so, unfortunately, in order to talk about how we model the basic building blocks of the universe and, they how, and how they interact with each other, we need to revisit a little bit what we think about the force. So, um, if I was to say the word force to you all, let's, in fact, what I'd even better like is transform into your high school cells, what do you think a force is? Push and pull. Thank you, great. Uh, so, yeah, so we are told um, in high school that forces are pushes and pulls that can change the state of motion of an object. Um, and uh, actually, um, on the quantum level, we think about them as being uh, very different. Um, so again, maybe let's just think about probably one of the, it's, it's ironic that it's the weakest fundamental force, but it does govern the large scale structure of our universe. So let's think of gravity. So we often think about a, a mass like um, a planet or a star as creating a gravitational force field. And then all objects um, that move in that force field feel the pull or the gravitational attraction associated with it. Um, so actually there are lots of problems with this idea of action at a distance when you think about um, bodies creating a force field that then causes forces um, to act on other objects. Um, but actually in the quantum world we think about the way in which forces go about as being, uh, yeah, being done in a very different way. So uh, okay, let's assume that I'm really good at throwing and I was to take a really large bowling ball and throw it towards the back of the lecture theatre as far as I can go. So the person that caught that very large volume ball, were I able to throw it hard enough, would probably likely then have to recoil backwards, right? So there has been a transfer of energy and momentum by me throwing a really large volume ball um, towards you. And actually this is a really good analogy for how we think forces behave on, um, on a quantum level. So rather than there being this idea of force fields that allow um, particles to feel uh, forces when they're in the proximity of other objects. We think about particles experiencing forces through the exchange of virtual messenger particles. Um, and each of the fundamental forces has its own set of carrier particles that we use um, to mediate these forces. So a really obvious um, thing you might ask at this point is, well, how does attraction work? 
because the whole bowling ball thing is kind of fine when you're just thinking about things that are telling each other, like we do when we have an electrostatic propulsion. Um, and actually, um, I've always really struggled to find a good analogy with this, but um, the best I can come up with is someone who's pretty good at boomerangs. So you can kind of throw it and then it comes back in and forces the particles closer together. Um, there's another thing, which is we, um, I guess, in our, the everyday world we live in, we think of forces as coming um, from lots of different sources. Um, however, on a quantum world, we actually think there are only four fundamental forces um, that, that impact uh, the, the particles in nature. Uh, anyone want to volunteer something? Um, we can also um, 
classify them by other properties related to the other forces. So um, I've already mentioned that particles feel the electromagnetic force if they have an electric charge, which is the quantity that tells you whether things attract or repel each other. Um, and in the other forces, you can basically associate equivalent charges. Um, so the strong interaction, as I said, the one that keeps the, the quarks inside the nucleus, that actually doesn't have a positive or negative type charge that we used to with electrostatics, but it has three colours, red, green and blue. And a lot of the strong interaction relies on the fact you can actually only combine quarks together into what we call a colourless combination, which is why we have three um, quarks inside the proton and the neutron. We also classify fundamental particles by um, a quantity called quantum mechanical spin. Is this something that anyone has heard of before? Or raise your hand if you have heard of it. Okay, if you have, if you haven't. Um, so when people say spin, they like to think about um, a spinning top. So the idea that all of our particles have a little axis and they're spinning about that. And unfortunately, one of the problems with quantum mechanical spin is it has no classical analog. So you can't really think of it as being associated with particles literally rotating um, in um, space. However, um, it turns out mathematically, you can treat it as a kind of quantum mechanical angular momentum that can be added mathematically to other components of angular momentum, but that isn't associated with any, um, with any movement um, through space. And it turns out that broadly, you can classify um, fundamental particles into two types based on their spin. So fermions um, are spin half particles, and bosons have integer spin, so spin one or spin zero in the case of the Higgs boson. Um, and actually, the quantum mechanical spin can have a big effect on the behaviour of um, these particles. But roughly, within the standard model, we think that matter is typically made of fermions, and then the forces that mediate the interactions are bosons. Um, however, there are uh, lots of extensions to the, the standard model which try to, to make symmetries between fermions and bosons. Okay, um, so at this point, I will be showing you a great table that shows you all of um, the particles in the standard model. Um, so it's basically the particle physicist version of the periodic table. Um, however, I can't do that, so I'll try and describe it um, in uh, as good a way as I can. Um, so uh, we already mentioned before that there's a, there are two types of quarks called the up and the down quark. Um, so these are the particles that make up atomic nuclei. So it turns out that there are three generations of quarks. So basically the, the up and the down are the lightest family. And then there are two heavier families that behave very similar, similarly. So the quarks are the only particles in the standard model that, are that obey the strong, uh, the, sorry, that feel the strong interaction. There's also another type of matter particle, which is also spin half, called fermions. Um, and the, uh, the electron is an example of a fermion. So um, the electron is in the lightest family of, um, of uh, the, um, yeah, the fermions. There's also a type of fundamental particle called a neutrino, which is also an um, electron, like the electron, but based on its name, neutrino, it's neutral, so it doesn't have any electric charge. And actually, um, every second, around 100 billion neutrinos from the sun pass through your fingertips, so you fill it up, they're going through all the time. So neutrinos, because they don't feel the strong interaction and they don't have any electric charge, they interact only very weakly with matter. Um, however, they are produced copiously in the nuclear reactions that take place in the sun, um, and they form a very um, important part of the standard model. So we have these matter particles, and actually it's interesting in itself that you can divide the matter particles into four, uh, three generations, sorry. Uh, and it's only really the first generation that we see in the atoms we, um, we uh, I guess, observe in the universe. The heavier ones, we've only been able to study by producing high energy collisions to measure them. We've also got the um, bosons that are responsible for mediating the forces. So the one you may have heard of before is the photon, which is responsible for the electromagnetic interaction. But there are also gluons, which are the carrier particles of the strong interaction. And I guess, as the name implies, they glue the nuclei together. And there are also some weak bosons associated with the weak interaction. 
There's one particle in the standard model I haven't mentioned yet. So has anyone picked up what it is? It was discovered in the last 10 years and named after a famous British scientist. Yay, thank you. Um, so there's one final particle in the standard model I haven't been able to mention that, and that's the Higgs particle. And actually, it wasn't discovered until 2012, and up to that point, it was the last missing piece in the standard model. And the fact that we haven't found it yet is problematic for a number of reasons, uh, but mainly because if the Higgs boson doesn't exist, then there's no way to explain how all the particles in the universe can acquire a mass. And we know that there are lots of massive particles. We are massive. So um, without the Higgs, the theory itself um, isn't very consistent. So um, the Higgs boson is also the only particle in the second model that has a spin of zero, and that in itself is quite interesting. Um, so one of the reasons that it's really hard to find the Higgs boson is annoyingly the theory didn't tell us what mass it has. Um, so and actually the way the Higgs boson uh, behaves uh, depends on its mass. So we have to do this systematic effort of searching for it over all the possible mass ranges that it could possibly exist. And the analogy for that would basically be, I, I told you I put a needle in a haystack somewhere in a field, but I haven't told you which haystack I put it in. So you have to go around and, and search some more. So not only is the Higgs boson responsible for, um, I guess, explaining how particles have a mass, but it also has a very big role in explaining how the electro, uh, so the electromagnetic and the weak interaction, which actually um, we seem to unify at high energies, behave very differently at lower energies. Any questions on what I've said so far? Okay, so um, unfortunately, although the standard model has been very successful at explaining a lot of observations in high energy physics, we know it can't provide a complete picture. And there are several shortcomings that expect us to, well, that lead us to expect some kind of new physics that can explain these problems. So one obvious one is that it doesn't include gravity, and uh, it would be pretty unsatisfactory for our grand theory of everything to not explain, um, well, how gravity works on a quantum level, but also why it's so much weaker than everything else. And another obvious example is uh, it doesn't tell us what dark matter is made of. So um, we, although we um, can see the effects of dark matter in the universe through looking at observations like gravitational lensing, um, and we know how much of it we think is in the universe, we don't have a candidate for it in the standard model. And actually, there are no particles within the standard model that have properties um, consistent with what we expect dark matter to have. Um, so what we then have to do is try and find uh, a way to do experiments to, um, to solve these shortcomings. So as I said before, a lot of the particles in the standard model, and in particular, a lot of the particles we're searching for to try and solve the mysteries um, about the standard model are heavy, so they wouldn't be stable, which means that if they did, um, if they were produced, they would decay very quickly, and it would be those decay products that we would try to measure um, in order to uh, reconstruct what we think happened. Um, so that means that basically the history of particle physics involves uh, building increasingly high energy colliders to smash things together, try to produce new particles, and see if the results of those collisions match what we predict or could be a sign of something new. Um, and there are basically two different ways that we can try to search for what I'm going to call new physics, so things that could explain the current gaps in our theory. Um, and I'm going to try and explain these through uh, a very, I guess, childish analogy that um, there's a heffalump under Winnie the Blue's bed, and we think the heffalump is stealing the honey, but we don't know if it's a heffalump or not. So what you could so you could you could do the search in two ways, right? You could do it directly, which would involve you know hiding in the room and waiting to try and see the heffalump, and you can you know interpret what I mean by see in a number. And if you did see the heffalump, so if you could measure it some way, either through a photo or through some other effect, then you could prove that the heffalump exists. The other thing you could do would be to try to search for it indirectly. So that's to say, look for effects that couldn't be explained by other known sources of honey going. So I guess the, the analogy there is, say, you know, Winnie the Pooh occasionally slept walked and ate some of the honey. You could do a measurement over a long period of time and prove that the rate at which that happened is not consistent with the rate of going away. 
Um, so this is a really terrible analogy to explain the different ways we can search for new physics at the LHC. So that's either, again, searching for evidence that we have directly produced new particles that we haven't seen before. And in the case of dark matter, that's something we're particularly interested in. So based on the way that dark matter behaves in the universe, there are some very strong theoretical arguments that we should be able to produce dark matter particles at the LHC. So we can actually search for evidence that we've directly produced the dark matter particles that then, um, along with other um, topologies in our collision events that are not consistent with anything known in stellar model. Or we can look for indirect effects. So this typically involves trying to make really precise measurements of things we already know about in the standard model. And if those measurements don't agree with what we predict, then again, that could be a sign of new things coming into play. And I'm not sure I'll get into it in the next uh, 10 minutes. However, um, within the high energy physics this year, there's actually been a lot of excitement related to potential indirect hints of, um, of new effects. Um, so one of them is the mu one g minus 2 measurement, which came out earlier this year. Um, so these are signs that muons, which are heavier versions of electrons, when you allow them to move in a magnetic field, the way that their spin processes in that magnetic field, so it kind of wobbles like a spinning top, is not consistent with what we expect in the standard model. And people think that could be because new hypothetical particles that we haven't seen before could be interfering with that. Um, there's also a set of results um, coming out to CERN um, that reinforce um, some results I've seen elsewhere as well called flavour anomalies. Um, and flavour in the standard model um, vaguely refers to this idea that we have three generations of matter particles. And we like to think that the forces in the standard model should treat these flavours agnostically with the, with the only difference coming from their masses. And there are starting to be hints emerging that actually some processes um, don't treat, for example, electrons and neons the same. Um, so unfortunately, whilst um, this is a very exciting area, the stuff I'm going to be talking about are the direct searches, so actually trying to produce dark matter in the LHC and trying to uh, detect signs that we might have seen something we haven't seen before. Any questions? Okay, good. I hope everyone's still with me. Um, so I'll talk a bit about CERN to begin with. So CERN is the European Research Centre for uh, what was nuclear physics. Which, uh, when it was founded, so it's not a European the research and nuclear, but has now evolved into a laboratory for high energy particle physics. So it was established in the aftermath of the Second World War when um, European countries realised that they needed to work together to avoid um, being left behind in scientific developments, uh, which at the time were being dominated by the US. Um, so since its foundation in 19, uh, 1954, it's housed an increasingly large suite of um, high-energy particle collider experiments. And the thing that's really cool is when you finish um, using a particular collider, it doesn't just get completely decommissioned. They now they use the previous experiments as kind of injector rings for the larger ones. So particles that are injected into the Large Hadron Collider don't immediately go from zero energy to the high energy collisions we produce, but instead they're sequentially accelerated using some of the old colliders and then injected in. So it's kind of cool, you're like looking back in time as you look at the CERN accelerator complex. So CERN currently houses the Large Hadron Collider, which is um, the highest energy particle accelerator in the world. Um, it's a 27 kilometer ring, um, that goes under the Swiss French border, which for context is around uh, the same size as the circle line. And uh, for anyone interested, about 10 to 15 years ago now, um, someone on April Fool's Day ran a story that they were going to turn the circle line into a particle physics experiment, which I actually, at the time, having been delayed on the circle line a few times, thought was really sensible. I nearly <laughs> repeated to other people before someone pointed out that it was actually April Fool's Day. So it's an enormous ring, and the reason we need such a big ring is that actually charged particles, when they're accelerated, lose energy um, due to synchrotron radiation. So, and that the energy they lose depends on the mass of the particle, but also of the radius of curvature of the ring they're moving around. So, roughly, building larger collide circular colliders allows you to go to higher energies because you have less problem with this energy loss. Um, so it's large, we've got that bar. Hadron refers to the things we're colliding. So protons are examples of hadrons, which is the general name you give to um, bad states of quarks. 
and earlier collider is pretty self-explanatory. Um, but it is worth saying that what we could call a collision in the LHC is not just single photons colliding. We're really trying to do really high statistics experiments. So a collision at the LHC is actually about a bunch of about 100 billion protons going past another bunch of 100 billion protons. And actually we're hoping that enough of these get close enough together to interact. But it's a very messy collision environment. Think about throwing two bags of rice together uh, and the kind of spray mess you get associated with it. And actually in a typical bunch crossing at the LHC, we have around 40 to 50 interactions taking place between actually the quarks inside the protons and only one of them probably something we're interested in. And these collisions are all also happening around 40 million times a second. Okay, so what we need to do in order to measure these collisions is build some kind of basically camera to capture these collision events. And the camera that we use, um, well I use, is called the Atlas Detector, which unsurprisingly, based on the scale of the collisions we're doing, is an enormous experiment. So it's um, around 45 meters, no, 46 meters long, 24 meters high, and 7,000 tons. So, um, you know, pick your favorite chapel within Cambridge, and the Atlas Detector is probably larger than that. Um, and it basically does act like uh, a digital camera operating 40 million times a second to take digital pictures of the particles produced in these collisions. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not quite as good as a camera because you can't see everything. But what we're doing is taking electronic measurements of the momentum and the energies of the particles produced so that we can try to reconstruct if we think that these decay products are consistent with the process we're trying to measure. Actually, also, the collisions are taking place in the LHC much quicker than we can possibly record our data. So actually, um, Atlas throws out most of the collision events um, it could record and only saves a certain number of them to disk. And these are selected by something called a trigger system we use to try um, and um, yeah, decide whether we think something's interesting or not. I mentioned earlier that the stuff we're trying to measure is often new heavy particles decaying into lighter particles. And actually, um, these processes are often many, many, many million times rarer than typical standard model process we understand very well. So this is why um, we need such high statistics to be sensitive to it, but it was also why we throw away a lot of our data sets. In order to visualize Atlas, which again is not the easiest thing to do without, without tools, think of it as like a giant cylindrical onion. So we have many layers around each other, and each layer is a different detector technology measuring a different thing about particles. And so by combining the information in all of these different layers, we can get basically a list of which particles we think were produced in a given collision event. It's actually even more messy than that because it turns out quarks, these are the weird ones inside the protons and neutrons, because of some characteristics of the strong interaction, you can't actually measure them on their own. So they're actually measured in the LHD as jets of particles. Um, do you think we can measure every type of particle in our detector? Based on what I said earlier about there being, you know, billions of neutrinos going through your fingertip every second, do you think it's likely that our detector can, can measure them? I don't think so. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so actually, um, there are a particular type of particle, so any neutral, weakly interacting particle would pass straight out of the detector but without leaving a signal. So the only way we can be sensitive to that is actually by measuring all the other particles using some conservation of momentum and realizing that there's something missing. Um, and actually, um, this would be exactly how a dark matter particle would look in our detector if that was, um, if that was created as well. Any questions? Okay, so um, let's assume that with our detector we can get a full, um, we can get a full list of which particles we think were produced in a given collision event. So how can I use that um, to, to search for dark matter? So I said already that we're basically at the will of quantum mechanical statistics. There's no way you can look at a single collision event and say the Higgs boson is there because it's gone within a fraction of a second and it's decayed into other things. So we have to use um, statistics in very large data sets. Um, and the best analogy I can give for that is say I gave you a dice that was ever so slightly biased. So it's you know, 49.99 versus 50 point blah 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 blah. 
Um, if um, if you uh, you know against two numbers, if you rolled it enough times, eventually you could prove that I cheated. And it would take a while. It would probably be quite boring. But you could do the statistics and work out how long you need to roll the dice for to work out that uh, I was I was cheating. And really, this is what we're doing in, uh, with these LHG collisions um, in Atlas. So we're looking at very large data sets and saying, well, actually, if this new particle did exist, I would see a few more events in a very large data set that, than I would expect just based on standard model processes. Because unfortunately, again, due to this quantum mechanical statistics problem, um, there are, if we're searching for a particular process, there are also going to be other standard model processes that could mimic that. So now um, I, I'm going to run out of time, um, and again, um, I, I guess hopefully if people have more questions, you can also come down and, and speak to me after. But I want to give you a feel for how, how we might actually go about searching for supersymmetry at the LHG. So I've said before that if we were to produce a dark matter particle, um, it would escape the detector without leaving a signal. Um, so this idea of missing momentum or missing energy in the, in the detector could be used um, to, as a sign that we might produce dark matter. And there are different ways we can actually try and design searches for dark matter. Um, and the ones that I've been working on are actually um, searches for a particular extension to the standard model that, um, that can give you a natural dark matter candidate. And this is something called supersymmetry which I will not go without slides into the details of at 7 p.m. on Tuesday night. But basically, supersymmetry says that these fermions of bosons that we think are really different types of particle are actually related. So every fermion in the standard model has a super partner that's a boson and vice versa. And this can solve mathematically quite a lot of the problems in the standard model. But the cool thing about supersymmetry is um, if you assume that the super partners have to be heavy, the lightest superpartner is actually stable, and that would be a really compelling candidate for dark matter, because we know dark matter doesn't interact with light, um, but it must interact gravitationally, and we expect that it should have some weak interaction with the standard model particles. There's actually something called the WIMP miracle, which says that um, if you assume uh, a history of the universe whereby dark matter and standard model particles were in thermal equilibrium early on, but then decoupled at some point, you can work out how many dark matter particles you get today based on the mass of the dark matter particle and how strongly it would interact with the standard model. And actually it turns out you can get roughly the right amount if you have a particle around the mass scale of a TeV, which is what we can code with the LHC, and with the same interaction strength as the weak interaction. So supersymmetry has been very popular because it has a candidate that, um, that can um, do that. Um, so I, I hopefully convince you that if dark matter did exist, then by E is equal to mc squared and by the predictions of the standard model, we could test whether or not we can produce it at the energy. Because we can say, okay, I'm going to search for a particular type of um, production of dark matter candidates, and then I'm going to look at how many I'd expect in the standard model and try to count whether the number I see in my data matches the prediction. Um, of course, there are, there are some ingredients about that in that that you have to get right. So you have to think you understand the standard model pretty well. In other words, you need to have a very good understanding of the typical backgrounds that could look like your signal. But once you've done that, you can then say, okay, well, I'm going to look at how I think the signal is going to look in the detector, and I'm going to design a search whereby, if it were there, I would see a statistically significant excess. Um, okay, so, I mean, I, I gave the punchline at the start of the talk. Have we seen dark matter yet? No. But um, we have used the data to place constraints on our model. So any null search still gives you useful information because what you can do is rule out parameter space in your theory that would have given you a signal by now. And actually we spent now two to three, well, two runs of the LHC, the next run of the LHC starts next year, um, trying to basically perform increasingly sensitive searches to new particles and ruling out the parameter space of our theory. 
Um, it also doesn't mean that we're not going to find dark matter at all. So the LHC is very good at searching for WIMPs, so the, the weakly interacting massive particles, but not so good for, to, for searching for other types of dark matter candidates. So um, it's actually really important that different areas of high energy physics and cosmology and astrophysics work together in order to, to maximise our chances of finding these particles. Um, I also said I'd talk a little bit about the future. So um, the LHC is currently shut down. We spent two years, well, most people have actually spent two years joining Zoom meetings from their kitchen. But also we have in parallel been able to do some valuable upgrade work on the accelerators and on the detectors. So we'll start its third data taking run next year. And uh, we'll, a we'll be aiming to um, create, to produce an even larger data set. So to put it into perspective, at the end of the second run of the LHC that finished in um, 2018, we'd already collected 10 times the data that we used to discover the Higgs. And roughly, as you go to more data, you're sensitive to rarer processes. So we'll now run uh, next year for a few more years um, at a slightly higher energy. So by the end of that run, we again should be able to be sensitive to some, some scenario we haven't seen before. There's going to be another big shutdown, um, and then we'll move to what we call high luminosity running. And that should increase the data set size by a factor of 10 um, by the end of 20, the 2030s. And that not only gives you lots of, um, I guess, lots of increased sensitivity for these direct searches, but we'll also be able to make precision measurements of the standard model in ways that we'll be able to do these indirect tests um, in a much, uh, to much higher precision than we've been able to do for now. And lots of people are very excited about actually making precision measurements of the Higgs boson, which could provide a very interesting portal to new physics. Um, I'm going to close in a couple of minutes, but um, I'll also just quickly say that um, you know we're not just um, going to run the LHC and if we find anything, you know, put our feet up and say that the standard model is, is good enough. So actually, the long life cycle of particle physics experiments means there's already discussions ongoing within the community of what we should build after the LHC. And of course, one very popular candidate would be to build an even bigger collider and use the LHC as an injector ring for that. Um, <laughs> so um, it's a new joke, but it's, it's, it's under consideration. So there's something called the Future Circular Collider, or FCC. So that would be a 100 kilometer ring, um, now having to go under mountains, that could be used as either an electron collider or as a proton collider. Um, and again, this would be a whole hour's talk in itself, but um, the reason people are quite interested in doing an electron collider is I mentioned at the start of the talk that electrons are what we think fundamental particles. So they give you very clean collision environments. Protons, as we've already said, are made of quarks. So actually, and we're, we're colliding them in bunches as well. So we're colliding in bunches of particles that are themselves made of other particles. Um, so it's a very messy collision environment. So. Um, protons can go to higher energies, which is great for potentially discovering new particles, but there is a harder environment in which to make precision measurements. So if we're saying the next thing we want to do is, um, build, is measure the Higgs, then maybe actually an electron collider would be better. So we could put electrons and positrons in our 100 kilometer ring, but we could also later on collide protons at energies up to 100 TeV. So that's basically 10 times the energy that we um, we're at now, uh, and if you think about going to higher energies as giving you the opportunity to produce heavier particles, that would be a big step in our sensitivity. Um, there are lots of challenges of potentially building a 100 TeV collider. Um, the biggest one, is, well, well, one of the biggest challenges is actually building the tunnel. So apparently a few years ago, Elon Musk tweeted at Rio de Gianetti, the Director General of CERN, offered help in building the tunnel. But we never, we never understood what the, the rate was going to be for building the tunnel, so I suspect it might not be that feasible. Um, so <laughs> there's another big technical challenge of, of this future experiment, which is actually the magnet technology. So as soon as you go to higher energies, you need stronger magnets to, um, to bend them around. And we have not yet got to the strength of magnet we would need for this ring. So it's quite interesting that our, I guess, physics goals for the next generation of experiment are actually starting to um, drive technological advances. Um, there are also, outside of the LHC, a wealth of smaller experiments that are trying to address the problems with the standard model that the LHC won't be able to do. So I mentioned, for example, that um, the 
dark matter could be made of nutrient directed massive particles, in which case the LHC would be great at searching for it. But it could also be made of other types of particles that would be harder to produce at the LHC. And there are lots of efforts ongoing to try and, um, to try and search for that. Okay, so um, I think in the interest of everyone's evening, I will stop now. Um, I'm really sorry that I'm speaking to you without any PowerPoint, and this might have been, I guess, therefore a bit in more information dense than you would have liked had there not been pictures. Um, but I hope it's given you a bit of an overview for the types of problems we're thinking about um, at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, I hope that the students in the room um, feel either suitably inspired or not put off to go and go into careers in science because we need you all to, to solve the, the, the questions and the problems of tomorrow. Um, and I'm happy to take questions if anyone has. Did you say that uh, finding dark energy is about, I'm uh, sorry, finding dark matter is about finding gaps in the data, like finding neutrinos, then how can you tell the difference between if you produce neutrinos or dark matter? That's a really good question. Um, so I didn't have time to go into this in my talk, um, but one of the constraints we have on what we expect dark matter to be is um, from cosmological ideas about how the universe evolved. So in particular, in order to um, allow structure formation in the early universe, we expect that um, at least a reasonable amount of dark matter must be what we call cold dark matter. So you can divide cold and hot dark matter by whether or not their particles would have been moving at relativistic velocities in the early universe. So basically to allow galaxies to clump together, you need a certain amount of dark matter to be what we call cold, or at least assuming a particular dynamical model of the universe. I, I'm always very worried at this point there's a cosmologist somewhere in here um, who's going to, I guess, point out that there are other mechanisms which there are. Um, but basically, neutrinos are, by definition, a certain proportion of dark matter because they don't interact with um, they don't interact with light. But you can't have all of dark matter. Um, there is, um, so I mean, there's lots of mysteries related to neutrinos, which again I can talk about very dear to the But uh, originally in the standard model, people thought neutrinos were uh, massless. And actually, you now understand them to have a very small mass, but still, you know, many orders of magnitude below the other matter particles. And it turns out that there's lots of theories about how neutrinos could acquire mass and why it's so small. Um, and there's questions about whether or not they acquire their mass through interaction with the Higgs, like the other matter particles do, or through some other mechanism. Um, and there is something like something called the seesaw mechanism, uh, which you maybe can visualise, which actually um, it's a mechanism for explaining how neutrinos could acquire mass, but it predicts some extra heavier neutrinos that are called sterile neutrinos. So they wouldn't actually even interact um, via, um, well, you, you, you wouldn't necessarily be able to, to test them in the same way we do um, for normal neutrinos. So these would be heavier, um, and actually um, they could be a viable dark matter candidate. Um, however, there was a result a few weeks ago that came out of one of the neutrino experiments in America that had seen a really exciting hint of something um, that could be a sterile neutrino, and then it went away when they did it again with more data. So 
Um, but yeah, so, it's, so that's one of the problems. Um, but for example, when constructing theories like supersymmetry, which is the one I say I work on, one way sometimes to explain how supersymmetry is what we call broken, which says, well, why are these potential particles we're looking for heavier than their partners, is to kind of involve gravity in that. So there's there are some models of supersymmetry where the dark matter particle is actually the partner of the graviton, which is called a gravitino. But anyway, it's, it's fun. Um, Yeah, as a student, I'm kind of interested in like, what your life be like working as a particle physicist because I'm the first time seeing a particle physicist. Okay, <laughs> um, I mean, I've had a good time, I'm still here. Um, so, I mean, one of the things I'd say about experimental particle physics nowadays is it's very collaborative. So I want the Atlas Collaboration, which is 3,000 physicists from all around the world. Um, it means that I'm also, as a medium, this is my surname, on the you know, seventh page of the Atlas Collaboration. Um, and sometimes there are lots of bureaucratic things you have to go through when you're publishing a paper on behalf of 3,000 people. However, um, you know, I really, I really value the fact that on a day-to-day -day basis, I interact with people all around the world from lots of different backgrounds. Um, you know, you can't produce a result on your own. You're working with other people, so that that I value. I've got to visit lots of really interesting places, maybe not the last two years. Um, so high energy physics, I guess, as well. At the through a bit of a revolution in terms of you know we're doing big data analysis so there's also lots of interplay with machine learning and big data which is quite interesting um, so yeah i guess i found it fun <laughs> <laughs> if anyone is interested in particle physics and is an undergraduate at the moment um, several particle physics laboratories around europe have summer internship programs that you can apply for at the end at, to do after your third year or your fourth year of fact so um, yeah, have a look if you're interested or email me. Okay, give another round of applause.